All right, so I think it's time that we start talking about the other side of counterinsurgency. So where am I going with this? Basically, before we've done a video on Robert D. Kaplan's book, Imperial Grunts, which talked about like basically the army and marine side of things. And this time we're going on to his book, Hog Pilots and Blue Water Grunts. Um, here's a picture, of the, here's the cover of the book, which is what I got. Um, which is basically like the Air Force and Navy side of things. Um, so, like you said, kind of the same same trip um, from the previous ones. Basically, he's a journalist who has written multiple books for and many, many countless articles for decades on basically, uh, we'll say, foreign affairs and travel just in general. Um, he was also part of the uh, DOD's policy board at one point for foreign affairs, that sort of thing. Um, for more on him, we'll just go into that previous video, which will be as a card later on. But anyways, one of the biggest things he kind of talks about in this book and really kind of goes more in depth on than in previous books is the NCO Corps that we have, which is something that to this day we still, or the American military, at least in my experience, has really harped on a whole lot. Um, so one thing I didn't know, and he goes into like the kind of groundwork and the kind of a little bit of the history of NCOs. So he talks, to take a quote, he says, the Prussian Baron Friedrich von Steuben during the 1777 to 78 winter at Valley Forge had laid the groundwork for this NCO Corps. Thus, he provided the bedrock for the American military, the radical decentralization of command, so that the general directive of every officer was broken down into practical steps by sergeants and corporals and petty officers at the farthest edges of the battlefield. Officers gave orders and NCOs got things done. So he goes on to say, the ever expanding frontier of Western settlement in North America was about doing, not imagining, clearing land, building shelters, obtaining food supplies, and so on. Um, he also compares the NCO Corps to basically being a product of the America's like middle class society as well, um, mostly because like you know class distinctions aren't as we'll say blatant here than they are in like other places like we'll talk about later in the book when he goes to nepal how it really is extremely segregated and extremely obvious like officers versus enlisted in terms of just like like they're li literally the officers are barons and the um enlisted are basically peasants right and obviously this is i'm using the words from the book um and basically how he's portraying it um, I'm sure there will be uh, a lot of anecdotal, uh, let's say anecdotal evidence to the contrary for some people, um, not really where this is going, more of just from the point of view of the book and how he wrote it and pretty much just portraying what he gives. So you, if you guys are interested, you guys can get the book, read it yourselves and basically have a discussion um, and comments and so on. It's kind of the purpose of me doing videos in general. But anyways, so there's that. Talks a lot about the NCO Corps. Um, one thing too, I made a comment and a little quote about the Western settlement in North America and the frontier um, and kind of manifest destiny. So one of the things that he's harped on through both of these books at least, because they're kind of a pair, um, and today is pretty much the focus. How do I want to word this? Like, War today doesn't seem, it's not like it was for like World War One and Two, where you had massive troop movements and so on, um, that sort of thing. Battles aren't the same as they used to. It's more of analogous to like the uh, 1700s, like the Indian Wars, Revolutionary War, that kind of, Revolutionary War probably isn't the best example, but like the Western Frontier fights in that time, right? Excuse me, so like, to take a quote that he brought from a general officer in the Pentagon, he says, small unit combat, again, a world, um, chose the wrong part to take a quote, so that's my bad. But basically, a lot of it is, he said that he was told that they found more benefit in studying the 19th century Indian Wars in North America 
than the two world wars combined for the former had featured mobile attack sequences, quick strikes and ambushes and skirmishes where combat was a matter of surprise more than a large scale maneuver, right? So, and then basically what I said before, uh, small unit combat again is a world of junior officers and NCOs, right? So again, this book is more for like the Navy and Air Force than with the conventional army, at least with the stories he gives in this book. Um, and pretty much, yeah, that's it. He starts off with basically with Africa. He spends a lot of time in Africa in this book. In this case, it was with uh, Marines training the, which country is in the first chapter? Because there's a few of them, oh, Nigerian, uh, the Nigerian military, basically. And a lot of it's kind of, it's doing the same thing in each one. Like he talks about this a lot in Imperial Grunts where basically you'd have like uh, Green Berets go into, for example, like Colombia and like trained um, the Colombian military for similar things. And it's a lot of just training instead of us actually going in there and doing it ourselves, at least with what he's talking about in his book. Um, so there's that. And this one starts off basically doing the same thing, just it's with the Marines, and in this case, the Nigerian military. Um, he also talks a bit about Air Force Reserves, um, specifically in the medical field, which seems to be one of the things he brings up a few times. And to take a quote, um, basically says, uh, Air Force doctors provided relief for worms and other ailments. This is in Niger, um, which is happening. Uh, which would return in a week or two anyway because of the primitive living, living conditions. And to quote uh, one of the physicians, he says, it's less than a health, it's a le well, it's less a health program than a health festival. It's kind of an exercise in futility and good intentions that still earns goodwill and gives technical service like the Air Force the field exposure it needs. Um, so yeah. And that's pretty much all I'll say about Niger because there's a whole bunch of other stuff in this book as well. And since we've already gone to like seven and a half minutes, but he goes on in The Last Frontier, right, basically talking about how Alaska has pretty much changed um, the U.S. military in a way. And it's kind of always been a thing. So a little bit of history on Alaska. So it's known as basically like R the Russian North America. And so it was known by... Um, William Henry Seward, who was President Johnson's Secretary of State, um, basically um, negotiated a treaty in 1867 to get Alaska, and this was known as Seward's Folly. Um, pretty much immediately, the U.S. Army uh, opened up Alaska and basically did put roads, ports, uh, early surveying, that sort of thing, um, and especially policing during the gold rush days. And then Alaska boomed in the 1940s uh, when it was a, became a base for protecting the U.S. mainland against Japanese attack, as well as a principal node for delivering aircraft to the Soviet Union via Siberia under the Lend-Lease Act to help Stalin fight Hitler in World War II. Um, talks a lot about how Alaska and the U.S. military are very tied together, um, especially like economically in general, because there's not much up there. And so there's a lot of things that we can do training wise up there that you just can't do anywhere else, especially with like the Air Force and flying, like noise constraints and so on. You just, there's nothing up there. So like, what are you, you're gonna disrupt a grizzly bear sleeping. It's not gonna be as bad as, you know, doing it in, I don't know, who knows, somewhere in the uh, continuous United States. Well, anyway, um, also talks about, let's not get ahead of myself, one of the things that was interesting about Alaska, to take another quote, um, so the ability to deploy large numbers of troops around the world at a moment's notice had been a Pentagon priority for years. Now that the Air Force was increasingly able to fly large numbers of soldiers over the North Pole, Iraq, I, I, uh, wow, Afghanistan, and Kosovo, I just can't talk this morning for some reason, um, uh, we're, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kosovo were only 5,000 miles away from Alaska, which is not much further 
than Korea and the Philippines. So the Alaskan military bases were closer to the Middle East than any other bases in the lower 48 states. So basically a lot of Alaska was used as kind of like a, a relay almost to go overseas where people were actually going. But he doesn't only talk about this too. He talks a lot about um, some of the experiences he had just in town, like around Anchorage, you know, near Elmo and Fort Wainwright and Fort Greeley that he talks about and when he starts to talk to um, about basically the um, kind of like missile defense program in a way uh, talks about missile sites um, always being in a state of quasi state of activation um, for like interceptor missiles and then basically talks about some of the science behind it too of how that stuff's going to work um, and just kind of like how it is there for them um, is one of the things he talks about a lot like how there's a lot of guard guys that um, work there and so like you get a different degree of expertise having like being able to stay in a place like that for so long or doing the same job for so long and not getting kind of passed around like a lot of the military tends to do All right so there's that um after his stint in alaska which is about is like winter 2004 um to early 2005 he goes and spends a lot of time on a navy destroyer and in this case once i get to the page All right, so this is mostly in the Indian Ocean. He spends a lot of his time, he travels to like um, across the Pacific multiple times, once in the destroyer and another time in a nuclear sub. But to start off with the destroyer, um, he really kind of, well, he starts it off. We'll start off with a quote like I tend to do. So in fact, uh, there was no more suitable organization in the world for emergency assistance than the US military with its air and sea lift capacity and the ability of its nuclear carriers to reprocess seawater into hundreds of thousands of gallons of drinking, fresh drinking water. After a tsunami, sailors aboard the Lincoln, the destroyer he, he went on, uh, stopped taking showers in order to provide as much water as possible to the victims. And that might have actually misspoke there. Uh, the Lincoln's the carrier strike group strike group that he was on before he went to the destroyer. Um, to continue the quote, the tsunami relief effort demonstrated a Navy's soft power to wit a carrier strike group offered an impact on land that was out of proportion to its small non-threatening footprint located as it was some miles offshore. So there's, and he talks a bit about this, like um, the soft power that navies can wield in a way because they're not like in your face they're not on in a country's land so like they're not actually in country in a way um and kind of describes how that somewhat changes they can play more of like a political role in a way it seems at least how he's kind of describes it throughout here um there's that he also goes on to talk about he does this a lot with a lot of his experiences and basically what i mean by this is he describes kind of the cultures and where he goes a bit more. So like he talked about it in, in the other book, Imperial Grunts, he talks about a lot of how like um, army special warfare works and kind of the culture behind the guys and how it changes from group to group. Um, and this one, like for the Navy, he talks a lot about the differences between like chief petty officers and the actual um, officer corps and so on. And he spends a lot of time with chiefs in the book um for that so like to take a quote on this kind of chiefs versus officers um dynamic at least from his experience he says the officers ran the ship but the chiefs made it happen the very word chief defined a senior non-commissioned officer in a way that sergeant major did not in other services so he says the chiefs were the fathers mothers priests dictators for the grunt uh, sailors um and talks a lot about uh he goes into, not necessarily an interview, but just a conversation he had with one of the chiefs on the Benfold. Um, that would have been Master Chief Craddock is the one who he talks about there. So to continue, um, like I said earlier, after the destroyer, the Benfold, he went to um, a nuclear sub. 
and pretty much kind of described a lot of his time there. It was a lot different than the the um, how the destroyer was, and not just in size. So for this one, um, he talks a bit more. How do I want to word this? We'll just bring up the quote. So basically, um, rather than large concentrations of infantry or surface warships in a confined geographical space, the stuff of conventional industrial age land and sea battles, there were now small clusters of combatants hiding out in cities, jungles, and deserts, as well as beneath coastal shelves and great oceans. So today, killing the enemy was easy. It was finding him that was difficult. Whether he was concealed amidst civilians on a crowded bizarre street or lurking in oceanic layers where sound waves traveled and refracted at unpredictable unpredictable speeds and angles. Uh, basically, this meant there was a massive premium on intel gathering in general. And then he goes into the Cold War on how uh, submarines were a principal means of spying. So basically, they'd collect electronic data close to the Soviet coastline. They could tap uh, underwater telephone cables. Um, they would snoop on the enemy's conversations more effectively than doing it so over like satellites and stuff just because the cable's right there and that's how the technology was at the time. Um, so it goes on to say, by the end of the Cold War, American nuclear attack submarines had carried out over 2,000 missions against the Soviet Union and its allies. Of these activities, the most important was tracking the boomers which were Soviet subs over 300 feet in length that packed up to 20 ballistic missiles with 10 nuclear warheads each. Um, and he talks a bit about how like, you know, the politics and stuff for submarines was a lot different than like the typical Navy in terms of, it was a lot easier to hide. Um, but that also, on the other hand, it uh, makes for a much different lifestyle, we'll say the least. And, um, yeah, we'll leave that there. Uh, he goes on to give examples of what these submarines did in the Cold War. Um, so not just like snooping around likely battlefields in Iran and North Korea like they did. He said they helped enforce the economic embargo against Iraq and seal off Bosnia and Haiti from arms shipments. They launched cruise missiles against Iraq during the fir first Gulf War and again in 97 and 98 against Serbs. Uh, Serb targets in Bosnia in 95. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, subs fired 25% of the Tomahawks in the Kosovo War in 1999, and a third of them in Operation Iraqi Freedom, OIF, in 2003. The first shot of OIF was fired from the USS Cheyenne, a Pearl Harbor-based sub. Um, the missile... The missile strikes against suspected chemical weapons facilities in Sudan and terrorist camps in Afghanistan in 1998 also came from submarines. And then he makes a little kind of a footnote about how the Tomahawk was designed originally to be primarily a submarine launched weapon as well. So really kind of seeing the difference between, you know, I guess kind of the secrecy of how a submarine can be versus the... Uh, kind of like in your face of a massive destroyer because those can be they're, they're really cool to be on on both of them if you guys ever go to like mobile alabama um they have the uss alabama and then whatever i forgot the name of the submarine but they're right next to each other and you can go on both and they're both really cool to do um the destroyer is obviously a lot bigger um and it was pretty eye-opening having to walk through a submarine because like i'm not necessarily small but like I can't imagine being a bigger person in a submarine at all. It was, it would be horrific to live in there, to be honest. Um, anyways, so to continue on, we're kind of done with the Navy at this point, and um, at least at this part of the book. Um, and then he goes back to uh, the Green Berets, this time in Algeria for the summer of 2005. And get to the page might actually skip this part because we talk about it a lot in um, the previous book with Imperial Grunts so it's kind of more of the same thing just a different story and a different experience um, just this one um, 
there was actually a lot in here that how he talked about how the Green Berets actually learned a lot from the Algerian um, military just because the Algerians have been there for so long and have been fighting this way for so long that they had stuff to teach them and instead. Um, so we'll kind of go past that, unfortunately, and go more into Nepal, which has a bit more kind of meat to it in general. So this is where, one thing I want to say, one thing I noticed while reading both of these books is there's kind of a, uh, a lot of, he, he doesn't necessarily make the analogies, but you kind of start to notice it. So in this case, like in Nepal, um, he talks about the Marxist styled uh, Maoist guerrilla movement there. Um, and he says their name at some point that I'm skipping, but it's very similar to that. Uh, what's the name of it? I talked about it in the previous book and unfortunately it's in the other room, but basically the uh, uh, Maduro's, I think, um, based the um, Islamic group in the Philippines, um, where basically they, uh, they they were did a bunch. They like only attack at night from uphill. Um, based they always they wear like amulets and and they do hallucinogens before they'd start fighting and stuff. And like one of the things that I remember from that is like literally the Colt forty five uh, pistol was created because the regular 38 caliber was quote unquote, not able to um, take a Maduro down, um, that sort of thing. But there's, there's a pretty decent analogy between this group, um, the Maduros, and the ones in Nepal that he's talking about here. So that's one of the big things is you start to notice like a lot of similarities and they're extremely media savvy too. So like he talks about like how outside journalists and stuff, um, it was a lot easier for them to talk to the, um, the Maoists here in Nepal, uh, in Nepal for this than it was for them to actually deal with the um, Nepalese government. And actually like, you know, being productive in that way, if that makes sense. Um, he also talks about some of the, to, to quote the term he uses, uh, mutilation atrocities that they've been doing there. Um, and kind of describes them in depth. Um, if you guys are kind of care about that whatsoever, but there's that. Um, I don't know, these videos are kind of going a bit long, so I kind of, have been skipping a lot in a way. And a lot of it too is like, I do these videos just to kind of like give a general review of the book. So if you guys like it or are interested in it, yeah, you can get information from the videos, but like read the book yourself because you get a lot more from it than just me talking. Um, and it also kind of helps me retain things too. It's like the reason like I remembered that Colt 45 comment was because I said it in the video and talked about it. Um, just things like that, but anyways, after that, um, we kind of skip ahead to, he's finally to the Air Force. Um, not necessarily last, but um, this one he calls the Blue Collar Plane. is because he goes and joins like an A-10 squadron for a bit. And I believe Korea was where this one was. Once I get to it. Um, but he talks a lot about, because there's a lot of... Uh, let me gather my thoughts for a second. So about the A-10, he says it wasn't fast and high tech and that was the point. Uh, A-10 pilots loitered over the battlefield risking gunfire and thus had real situational awareness. Um, and basically kind of con compares them to being like the special forces culture for the Air Force in a way, at least for pilots. Um, he talks about and makes a little jab. So this is a quote. I'll preface that. Um, so after a high ranking officer had uprated two A-10 pilots for flying too low over an airfield, a third pilot came up to me and said, referring to the high ranking officer, he's from the B-1 community. He doesn't know what low is. And then he went on 
we're a culture that asks for forgiveness after the fact rather than permission before the fact. That's the only way to accomplish our mission, which is for most of the time is CAS, close air support, um, which if you know what that is, like it's definitely a lot different than the B1 community would deal with. Not saying like one's better than the other, just they're different, different, different missions and they're kind of difficult to compare. But for this one, Excuse me. This squadron, he was he was with the 25th um, in the Korean Peninsula. Pretty much does a lot of DMZ. We'll say monitoring, I guess, um, for this one. But he goes a lot into that, and a lot of what, like the A10s do. One of the things I really enjoy about his writing is when he does talk to these people. He doesn't. I mean, he does kind of like, not like a personality analysis, but like he talks about like how the individual people are different from community to community and like and not just personality but also like background too where you can definitely see there are certain types of people that gravitate and stay in certain like subsections in the military um so there's that uh, he talks more about Africa, the Philippines, and Colombia which are places he's been multiple times throughout both of these books and kind of we'll finish off with he starts talking about uh predators the predator drone the mq1b in this case and uh b2s um which deals a lot more with like skiffs and so on um being based in nevada for the, at least the group he was with this time so to say a few things about the Predator, he says it's the most famous of several dozen unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, that the military operated. Um, it first saw action in the 1990s in the Balkans, but made its bones in November of 2002 in Yemen. And talks about uh, certain Hellfire missiles that were meant for certain people um, and some high profile, well, high profile uh, terrorist cases during that time. Um, talks a bit about like kind of not necessarily the science, but some of the specs about the predators too. How it flew a lot slower than even the slowest planes could do. Um, saying like the predator could travel at only seventy five knots and still remain airborne, whereas the other planes had to fly at at least one eighty. Um, at least for what he's saying here, um, and how it's used a lot for uh, soft teams and marine platoons and so on in that case but that's kind of all i'm going to say for like the story part of this book his afterwards if you guys are still with me after 30 minutes um he goes into talk and kind of finish about one of the things that i guess the general theme of what he learned throughout this whole these few years of what as he was doing this traveling with the u.s military and so on um talks a lot about patriotism and for this we'll definitely get a few quotes um as per usual at least with me but his afterwards called the non-warrior democracy and really kind of just talks about the change in we'll say psyche between what he's noticed between how at least historically the united states has been and the differences in like it's like the personalities of the types of people he was with. So like how American units are kind of psychologically different than a lot of the grungy like backwater places he's been um, to where like just the people have a much different mentality. So this isn't entirely related to what I just said, but to start with quotes for the uh, for context and stuff in the afterward. So a non-warrior democracy with a very limited appetite for casualties is a good thing in terms of putting brakes on a directionless war strategy. All I'm saying, the author, uh, Robert Kaplan, um, is that we as a people, as we grow increasingly prosperous, will find it harder to wage war. And typically, or what he kind of means by this from context clues for the rest of the book, is kind of like a World War II type scenario is where he's going, like very high casualty, very intense uh, places. Um, or I guess conflicts in a way, like full out wars rather than just like typically your conflicts we have nowadays. Um, 
one thing he noticed is stark religious faith in concert with the generally irreligious global media makes it makes for a cheap and efficient weapon of war. Of course, nationalism is another form of faith, nationalism of a kind that is going out of fashion among sectors of the American elite could also defeat us. And starts to talk about like the differences between, I guess what kind of moves like a lot of, as he says, the American elite and a lot of like the actual people that he dealt with um, during his time traveling with the US military. Um, he talks about in such a world, the real threat to our national security may be our own lack of faith in ourselves, which in turn leads to an overdependence on technology by our military establishment. How to kill at no risk to our troops is only in our eyes a sign of strength. In those of our enemy, it is a sign of is it is a sign of weakness, cowardice even. And just especially like we're so um, technology focused now that a lot of those I don't want to say out of date but more try, can't think of a, the best word for it. I guess out of date in the in the past way of thinking um, would have been completely different you know the things that like we saw as courageous say um, 80 years ago um, is different than what we do now. So to continue, uh, he talks a bit more about faith. So faith, which is about struggle and having confidence precisely when the odds are the worst, is receding among a social and economic class that is increasingly motivated by universal values. That is caring for the suffering of famine victims abroad as much as hurricane victims at home. Universal values are not the opposite of faith but they should never be confused with it. You may care to the point of tears about the suffering of humankind without having the will to actually fight, uh, let alone inconvenience yourself for your concerns. Thus, if accompanied by a loss of faith, universal values pose an existential challenge to national security. Um, and kind of where he seems to go with this is a lot with like the kind of politics of elites in a way and talks a lot about like Ivy League schools that sort of things later on later on in the next few paragraphs um and really talking about like basically like things that we do now that could get us into conflicts but we don't have the under underlying kind of like uh foundational values in this case he's talking about like faith nationalism patriotism that sort of thing to really kind of drive it um and that's a lot of where he kind of goes. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. The rest is kind of like closing remarks and so on. One thing, one thing I'll kind of finish this off with, a lot of what these videos are is kind of in general, um, gaining familiarity with not just the history but also like kind of how the politics is in a way so i'm not sure where i want to go with this so a lot of what these two books are is he's hopping around the world literally and talking about pretty much the imperialistic nature that the United States has gone. And like in the previous book, he talks a bit about how, like what that imperialism kind of means. And it's not necessarily what a lot of people tend to think it is. It's more of like, I made a short um, titled imperialism in self-defense. And that's kind of the way he goes about this. And you tend to see those major, um, what's the word for it? Uh, I don't know, whatever. Uh, one of the world global uh, global powers, um, you tend to, they tend to get so far stretched, not because um, they're trying to conquer the world or anything, but because their interests for their own self preservation are getting so intertwined with the rest of the world that in order to kind of try to guarantee their own safety, they have to kind of be imperialistic. 
um, is kind of where he goes with, it seems, on a lot of these books. Um, for you guys, um, if you've read his books, read more of his work too, because like I said, he was, he was a writer for The Atlantic for at least 30 years um, and a few other places as well. If you have more of his work, have more kind of essay on him in general, um, please say so in the comments and, you know, give one thing would, that would be nice is like actually giving like links or citations for some of the stuff, um, people bring up, which I probably won't happen. Um, I like to do it or at least make it somewhat available and say like where I got information from because it's helpful, especially when making an argument. But a lot of this too is just me kind of going through it and kind of learning it myself. So like doing this really helps with retention um, and just kind of building general kind of situational awareness on not just history, but like, you know, how the world actually works. Um, and it's important to get different points of view and a bunch of other things. But anyways, this video has gone on long enough um, kind of trying to see how these longer form videos are working for you guys too. If you guys actually want to watch them this long or piecemeal it or whatever. But anyways, I'm going to leave this one here. Um, as I said before, Imperial, Imperial Grunts, the, his other book on mostly ground units is going to be as a card, probably in the top right corner. And yeah, with that being said, I'm going to leave this one here. Feel free to comment and let me know how I did or just comments in general. Like the whole point of these is to make, to create the discussion and so on. Um, but anyways, I'm going to leave this one here and hope to see you on the next one.